Hi everyone, it is a trifecta, a third episode with Dr. Gene Cannonberg Jr. Uh, we've talked a couple of times now about comics history. The last time that we talked, we traveled in some interesting directions talking about African art. And uh, on this episode, we are talking about a book that has been hinting in the shadows of our talks a little bit. But I think we're now fully allowed to talk about Here Comes Charlie Brown, a Peanuts pop-up. Um, so a very char Charles, try that again, Charles Schultz focused episode um, with some celebration of Peanuts today. Uh, Dr. Cannonberg, thank you for jumping in and joining. Thank you very much. And number one, please, Gene. Sure, and, sure. Number, and number two, you beat me to trifecta. I was going to use that, <laughs> <laughs> but you got me, you got me there. Uh, yeah, I'm super happy to talk about this book. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a long journey that started pre COVID. Uh, -huh. uh, well, actually it started when I was probably four, but, uh, the actual book itself start, started pre COVID, but, uh, uh, in literally a month and a day, it, uh, drops as the kids say uh, -huh, uh -huh. to the general public and uh yeah i'm uh, really excited about it it's it's my book but it's really a team effort and uh because i've never worked in commercial publishing before and working with abrams comic arts is like the big the biggest of the big leagues uh -huh, uh -huh. and uh it's ju it's just been amazing to see what my little what what was my little thing has become yeah yeah absolutely uh, you mentioned abrams i appreciate the work that they publish and have been reading their books for some time i uh share books share book reviews about their books every now and then whenever i get the chance and they publish really interesting visual amazing stuff yeah they, they, they've hurt my bank account quite a bit mm-hmm mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, maybe they'll replenish some of it now. Maybe, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully so. Um, so actually, Charles Schultz and Peanuts has been getting some attention this weekend. There's been a meme floating around talking about the inclusive nature of Charles Schultz's work, and in particular, um, this one strip that the publisher wanted him to change that apparently showed a, a black character at school with Charlie Brown. And so the the thing that's been going around social media this weekend, have you seen this where uh, it's... Oh, yeah. Yeah, where he's like, well, we can either uh, fire me or you can publish it as it is. Yeah, yeah. And that's Franklin. And uh, it's uh, actually, Franklin doesn't go to Charlie Brown's school. Franklin goes to uh, the school that uh, Pepper and Patty and Marcy go to. Ah, okay. But even mm -hmm. that was too much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot of Franklin uh, in the news, just kind of in general, uh, for Black History Month in particular. But uh, uh, you'll be seeing th there's there's uh, Fra Franklin comes in the news and stays in the news, and there will there will be more Franklin to come at some point. Uh, there's the, there's there's always more, uh, but. Uh, uh, it's it's a it's a very interesting the backstory on Franklin is very interesting and maybe we can get into that in another time all at another time also. Yeah, yeah, you're already planning a quartet. I love it. But but the next time, <laughs> uh, if you want to go something quad, I'll I'll have you lead with that. Um, so it sounds like you you have this history that goes back. You said to the age of four. Uh, so curious to hear a little bit of the back the backstory. Yeah, well, I was a as a child, I I was born in '66, but as a child of the '70s, you pretty much could not escape Peanuts mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. Peanuts was in basically every newspaper across the land in the U.S. of A. But also the between the merchandising and advertising and the animated specials, excuse me, and uh, everything else, uh, Peanuts was just literally ubiquitous. But uh, even beyond that, uh, if you are of a certain age, uh, every month the Scholastic Book Club catalog would come to uh, your classroom and you would be able to buy books uh -huh. on the cheap. And my younger brother, John, 
uh, would always buy whatever Peanuts book was on sale. And those Peanuts books uh, were, which I didn't quite understand at the time because I was very young and didn't know a whole lot. Uh, those were, uh, they took the original uh, Signet books, or so, sorry, the, the original the, the original paperback uh, Peanuts books, and they basically chopped them in half and made them pocketbook size. And they gave them different titles. And so everyone was selected cartoons from Good Grief, More Peanuts, Volume 1. Selected cartoons from Good Grief, More Peanuts, Volume 2. Mm -hmm. And as a child who would literally read the indicias in, in books, I didn't understand how, like, they really published books that were Volume 1 and then Volume 2. And then they're, and now these books are partially book uh, strips from both of those different books uh but basically they just chopped them in half they just chopped the book in half and then it described them very differently but anyways uh we had all basically because of my brother we had all of those books in the house mm. so basically every lunchtime over bowls of soup or whatever we were eating uh when we would come home for lunch because we would because our local grade school was close enough we would walk school walk home for lunch uh, as we're chowing down on our soup we're reading peanuts books i mean mm -hmm. literally so like every day we're reading <laughs> peanuts books and as a young child i as a very young child uh, it took me i didn't have much hair and it, it's, it's kind of come back to that mm -hmm. so I, apparently one of uh the neighbors uh in the first place that uh my parents lived started to call me charlie brown ah so i've been charlie brown my whole life and as a as a self-proclaimed lovable loser less lovable more loser <laughs> i identified a lot with charlie brown as a character mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so it's Charlie Brown has never been far from my conscience one way or another. Um, yeah. And uh, just, it became, it. it's, what did, was it, what did, was it Bill Griffith who said about Nancy that it's harder not to read Nancy than it is just to read Nancy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Peanuts was kind of like that also. Um, when it got into the 80s and things like that, uh, I kind of... I, even back in days when there were still newspapers to read, or at least I was exposed to newspapers, I stopped. I, it became, it felt like it was becoming kind of repetitive and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I was, I didn't pay as much attention to it at that time. But in the 90s, when we didn't realize it, but this was the last decade of the strip, the last few decades, the, la the last few decades, the last few years of Peanuts, show was like firing on all cylinders again mm -hmm. if you read the last two or like the last two years of peanuts are amazing rerun uh linus uh, linus and lucy's little brother becomes an underground cartoonist or sorry basement cartoonist uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> and, he, and, he like, and his idea of a underground cartoonist is i have a uh, Tarzan and Batman fighting dinosaurs and things. It's just, but like the, it, it was like he got like not a second wind, but like maybe his 32nd wind or whatever. <laughs> and like the, the, the art was getting sketchier and sketchier and, uh, or kind of a looser, of course, but the ideas were super fresh and I was I was amazed at those last couple of years because you know he couldn't keep doing this forever, but like this was like just as good as almost anything that had been 30, 40 years before. I was super amazed at it all. And so I was I I just I just always, always loved peanuts. And uh after Schultz sadly passed um i was uh invited and here i'd like to share my screen if i could absolutely 
Uh, let me go ahead and do this. And I am going to go here, share this. And are you seeing mm -hmm. Charles Schultz Conversations? Yes, I am. Uh, okay. Uh, this is a book uh, published in the year 2000. Uh, boy, that sounds like science fiction. <laughs> you know? uh, by a good friend of mine, M. Thomas Inge, who sadly passed away. But uh, this is published 2000 uh, uh, by M. Thomas Inge, who is a, a scholar of Southern humor, but also of comics. He was one of the, if not first, second generation of comic scholars. Uh -huh. And uh, he was the editor of the of University Press of Mississippi's Conver Conversations with Cartoonist Lines. And this was the book that kicked off that uh series nice uh, wonderful start to a series yeah yeah fantastic and uh and he got the new sparky as he was able to call him because he knew because he had spent a lot of time with him and knew him very well and uh once schultz passed uh that very next year at the modern language association conference Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tom, through the auspices of the uh, uh, American Humor Studies Association, organized a panel in tribute to Charles Schultz. And it was an honor that Tom asked me to be on that panel. And I was kind of overwhelmed because, like, how do I talk about peanuts? Mm hmm and uh so what i did i did what i typically do in situations like that is i approached on a slant and i talked about uh peanuts uh uh parodies and pastiches uh, so i was i i didn't i i felt too overwhelmed to talk about schultz himself because again uh much like linda berry's work Charles uh -huh. Schultz's uh -huh. work is just so deeply ingrained that it's hard to, I found it hard to be critical about it, but I could talk about how other people had used Schultz's work and how they had approached trying to work like Schultz. Uh -huh. uh, so I did that. And uh, that essay eventually, Tom was kind enough to publish that essay in an issue of Studies in American Humor and many, many, many years later, like about five years ago, that essay got published in uh, the comics of Charles Schultz, The Good Grief of Modern Life. It was edited oh, by Gerald, nice. Jared Gardner and Ian Gordon, mm -hmm. which, uh, again, to have my name, to have my writing in a book about Charles Schultz, that was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think it does, it's not going to get better than that. Uh, but that panel itself, uh, number one, it has it had the biggest audience I had ever spoken in front of in my life. That mm -hmm. panel was it was it was in a very very large panel at the Model Language Association at MLA. It was a huge room, and it was standing room only. Everybody wanted to come see this panel. And my good friend Charles Schultz, it's Charles Schultz, my good friend Charles Hatfield was another one of the people on the panel. And I'm, I'm right now I'm just blanking on the third name of the person. But I can tell you the third name of the person because the panel became a little bit infamous. Uh -huh. And here I have to stop sharing. And then reshare. Okay. Because I get to show you the ridiculous thing. <laughs> um, there was a thing at this time, this was the year 2000, 2001. Uh -huh. uh, accuracy in academia. This was a conservative watchdog group. 
that was, uh, if not headed by at least uh, one of the main people involved in it, was Lynn Cheney, who was then Second Lady of the United States of America. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, they published this list, Sanity MIA at MLA panels. And if you go down to the bottom of the list, Peanuts at 50. And you see me. Mm-hmm. And you see Scott Stoddard, who was the second person on the panel, and Charles Hatfield. Mm-hmm. And so basically, I got on Lynn Cheney's shit list for talking about peanuts. And I take that as a mark of pride. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, good thing that she was tackling the, the major issues. The major the issues of the day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, yeah. Bigger and to- bigotry, tolerance, and diversity. How dare people talk about topics like that? Yeah. Yeah, it's just uh, just completely maddening. Of course, this page no longer exists. Accuracy in academia still exists, but of course, things like this are wiped off their webpage. But the Wayback Machine tells no lies, mm-hmm. so that still exists. Uh, but the other thing about this panel was that it was also written up in the New York Times. Hey, Mom, I'm in the New York Times. <laughs> and it got a actually quite a big... Uh, quite a big write-up including and this is i just put it all on one page and uh it's got a uh, one of the examples that they use here is good old gregor brown Mm -hmm. by cartoonist arsa koryak which is his peanuts peanuts adaptation of kafka's metamorphosis which Mm -hmm. is which i originally saw in raw and it's one of the most brilliant adaptations i've ever seen because it takes the idea of Kafka's metamorphosis and it tells it in a series of Peanuts comic strips where each strip has a punchline uh-huh. and it moves through the entire story of the metamorphosis and it ends with either Snoopy or Lucy, I forget, it's been a long time since I've read it. Uh, and the very last, the very last punchline is either Snoopy or Lucy dressed as a maid saying happiness is a pest free home. <laughs> just absolutely brilliant but uh, so anyway that's been my that, that was my basic history with peanuts mm-hmm. up until recently it's a it's you a asked. storied history yes <laughs> yeah um so you you've taken the pop-up book approach um, you mentioned last time you were looking at some of the sort of examples and uh thinking about ways of making books and so i'm curious what inspired that approach and what that process was like yeah well that uh, it grew out of the uh, co- uh a course that i took for my library degree mm-hmm. that i wound up uh getting uh because i've been working in a library for almost 10 years and about five years ago i decided that that i would take them up on their offer of if you get a library degree we will reimburse you for it i said okay i was a little afraid of going back to school after being out of school for many 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 years and having been a professor for a while myself uh so i uh, started a little slowly uh, but I also took the opportunity to take courses that were just things that I was interested in for a long time. Mm-hmm. Sure. And one of the courses that I took was bookbinding. Because uh, I was always interested in the idea of making books. Mm-hmm. And, we, and we went all over the place in this course. Uh, starting from the simplest pamphlet to ending with making an actual hardcover book. Uh, and these are all skills that kind of build upon each other. We take, sometimes taking detours into making carousel books and things like this, books that kind of uh, wrap around themselves, mm-hmm. multi-layer things, things like this. And for our final project, we could do whatever we wanted. So for my final project, I, I like the idea of the carousel book because it gives you layers. 
that you can play with. And I thought uh, one of the things that I re- one of the things that I really love in comics is the Steve Ditko Doctor Strange stories. Mm-hmm. And what I especially love are the environments that he created. And so I'm going to share the screen again. I'm going to go over here. Sure. I love that you brought uh, visuals. Okay. Well, I got to bring the visuals. This, mm-hmm. If you're gonna if you're gonna do something visual, you got to show this. You got to show the stuff. One more. Let me go one more. So, anyways, this was my final project for the class. It's a little book here with uh, I had to I had to put in the cover. I figured I would use the window from the Sanctum Sanctorum uh-huh. because I. Because I'm a nerd. I like uh, it. And uh, what I did was I basically made a carousel book. And the carousel book, uh, you're able to open it like this. So in theory, it all wraps around. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, what I wanted to do is I wanted to focus purely on uh, pu- purely on landscapes or uh metaphysical scapes in this case and i didn't want to use any language i didn't i didn't want you to see people i didn't want you to see word balloons Mm -hmm. but i wanted some kind of language in there and the comics that i make uh, on my own as a cartoonist i do what's called a scenic language Uh, i write letters that i write things that look like they should be letters and that that should tell words but don't actually have hold any semantic context. Ah, interesting. But uh, the story that I thought gave me the most to work with was the story called A Nameless Land, A Timeless Time. So mm-hmm. I figured I would use that. And if you and as I, as I tilt this, you can see that what I did was I layered the so there's there's lots of uh, careful cutting in here. So everything is doubled or tripled in there. Huh. And what I also did was that uh, cover there, the the title there pops up. Uh-huh. We didn't uh-huh. learn we didn't learn how to make pop ups in the class. Uh, so what I did was I work in a library and I went and I found a book on how to make pop ups and I found a simple pop up mechanism that allowed me to do that. So then I went to the next one. And again, this is another environment from the, from the same book. Sometimes I would trim things down. I would get rid of any captions or it might be part of a larger, might be part of a larger panel. Actually, let me put some light on this here. You can see a little better. Uh, And but I decided I did want to have captions on these. So it would be more like my comics. Mm. So I've got these captions here and these are all elements from a different issue of Dr. Strange where Dr. Strange is reading a mystic scroll. And so I using Photoshop, I took that scroll and I grabbed all of the different sigils from the scroll and then I made these quick and dirty little captions. Huh. And again, all the all the all the captions are pop-ups also. So you've got three layers for each opening and a scroll. Very, very this one interesting. Is, this, this, this one is simple, but I liked it. And then for the last two, it's the very end of the story. And so you've got that and that, and if you put the two together because it's a carousel book, Mm -hmm. there's no spine. So you can kind of see how I took one panel and made two, but I reframed them a little bit. So it wasn't quite as obvious. Uh Uh And then I did little things like, well, since we've got this curving here, I made a little curve there, just trying to make little uh, things uh, things to uh, 
like little visual rhymes and things like that. And the way the books are constructed, everything is hand sewn. So mm. when when you put these things together, there's a there's a there's a lot of gluing and also a lot of sewing. So there's some literal blood mm. in a couple of places here as I had to uh, uh, sew things together. Wow. So that that was that was my final project, and uh, it got a nice grade. So I was happy about that. Yeah, yeah. Does and uh, that. and about a month after the class was over, this other idea popped into my head. You know that first Peanuts comic strip? That would look really cool this way. Mm-hmm. And so. And I, I had the idea in my head and <laughs> it just wouldn't leave my head until it left my hands. And that's honestly what happened. So I basically did the same thing. Here comes old Charlie Brown. And one thing that I had to do, both of these things I could, I call tributes to the artists. Because mm-hmm. I didn't want, I didn't change anything in the Ditko book. All I did was trim things so that you would, you would see whatever the one thing i changed in this book is that i was able to do what i couldn't do in the other one is that there's no doubling here so if something is on one level it's not on the level behind it but what you can see here is that this word balloon cuts off the top of shermie's head Mm -hmm. these two characters are shermie and patty that's not peppermint patty that's the first patty and both shermie and patty disappear after a couple of decades Mm -hmm. so I had to build the top of Shermie's head and I built the top of Shermie's head using lines from other images of Shermie later on in the text. So I didn't, I didn't draw any new lines. I used Schultz's actual lines because that's how much of a nerd I am. <laughs> and I used the same topic, sorry, used the same technique for the captions. So I made, I made Charlie Brown pop up Yes, sir. Good old Charlie Brown. In this way, Shermie's actually literally speaking behind Charlie Brown's back Uh visually. Good old Charlie Brown. How I hate him. (laughs) And I made the how I hate him pop up also. So that kind of uh, draws your attention to that to that. So really, how could this relate to that to that smiling little faith Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so there's that and for both of those two books i'll stop sharing for both of those two books i wound up putting those videos online Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they both went i can't really say viral but they each each video got thousands of views spread over several platforms and for me that was like what yeah yeah (laughs) but uh, people appreciated them and for the charlie brown one uh uh is it dd daggett the daily cartoonist uh picked this up picked up the uh charlie brown one and said peanuts needs to publish this Mm -hmm. and so then i screen capped that and i retweeted and re-instagrammed that to say what a nice thing for someone to say and then i got a message from a couple of different publishers but one of the publishers was uh one of the people was uh charlie cockman the editor at abrams mm-hmm, mm-hmm. who said i've seen your video i've shown it to the people at peanuts worldwide they would like us to do this book. Love it. And I was like, what? <laughs> that, this, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that's how it happened. Wow. And, uh, and what, what winds up happening is that Is that this Mm -hmm. becomes that? 
and you can see there's quite a bit of difference between the two. Love the evolution. And, yeah, and that difference, the outer difference is totally down to the designer at Abrams, uh, a designer by the name of Sean Dahl. She mm -hmm. came up with amazing, amazing ideas for this book. Uh, and also uh, uh, Chip Kidd, mm -hmm. who was originally not going to design the cover because they couldn't afford him, but Chip loved the concept so much that he said, oh, I think the cover should look like this. <laughs> but I can't do uh, I can't do Benday dot coloring. So Gene can do it, but I think it should look like this. And Chip also, and you notice the one one of the many cool things about this book uh, is that you know it's got all the cool stuff back there. They put uh, Sean put Charlie Brown in the UPC box. Awesome, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you notice it's got a spine on both sides, and the spine is the Charlie Brown zigzag, which is fantastic. It has three hard covers, so it opens this other way, and it reveals. Nice. Autofocus. It reveals a tear sheet for this very first strip. And it reveals uh, uh, one of the pieces of editorial, uh, one of the pieces of material that was used to try to sell the strip to, editor to, to newspaper editors mm -hmm. in the first. And then you open it up and you get all your, all your good stuff, all your other stuff here and uh chip chip kid uh, suggested both of these nice uh, also and that kind of dictated the third cover when they showed me the third cover i was like oh my god that is so brilliant mm -hmm. so again to be very clear i can take no credit for how cool <laughs> the book object itself is uh, that's why that's why i say this is a team effort it's really really something but then when you get into the book itself, it's pretty much the same thing. I wound up making some different choices as to where the layers land. Mm -hmm. But I also uh, colored it using kind of a mid-century faux bende dot techniques. Not 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 bende, but uh, uh, similar. Uh, I use some commercial software that allows me to redo that. But the original comics were, of course, in black and white. And uh, this, and for the first uh, years, for the first several months, there were no Sundays either. So mm -hmm. there were no color guides to really go for for these characters. And uh, the so I was had to make up colors for these. Uh, Patty's hair is often red but not always things like that so mm -hmm. her hair determines uh her dress color basically because charlie brown i wanted charlie brown to have the original red shirt mm -hmm. before he goes to the yellow uh that's why he's not on the enterprise because he looks red mm -hmm. uh charlie brown, the images are a lot bigger but uh also we but again we've still got the same layers I hate him. And then I've got a big old essay in the back where I kind of describe some of the things that we've talked about, Very but cool. some other things also. And uh, it's uh, it's a hefty volume. It's almost like uh, Ignatz Mouse's brick. You can hurt somebody with this. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's, a very, it's a very sturdy little volume. Uh, and that's... And that's the story of the book. It's uh, it's been a collaboration. Uh, the original dummy of it that uh, Abram sent to the Chinese publisher, the Chinese printer, to get it priced first got hung up in Chinese New Year uh -huh. because everything shuts down for a year or for a month, and then it got hung up in this thing called COVID. Right, right. <laughs> so. Things took a while, and then the size of the book got changed uh, as we were working on it. But uh, at this point, 
at this point, uh, again, it is done. Uh, the drop date is March 26th, and it is the first of a series. Oh, awesome. So there's more to come. There are more to come, yeah. We're, we're, uh, we're just waiting on the contracts for the next two. So I know what the next two are, and no, I cannot say what they are. <laughs> but we may be announcing the next two at New York Comic Con. Because next year is Peanut's 75th anniversary. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. So this is kind of a lead in. This is sort of a lead into that. And what better way to lead in than with the very, very first strip? Yeah. And again, I did it purely because it just seemed like a cool thing to do. And again, the great thing about this format is that for the first 30 some years of Peanuts, all the dailies are four equally sized panels. Mm hmm. So for that first 35-ish years or so, any strip is potentially fair game. Mm -hmm. Although I find it works best when you've got at least two characters because you need drama and you need layers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Literally uh, just, and in terms of the story. Right, exactly. Uh, because I was looking at one that I was considering for one of the next books and it was a single character and I realized a single character is just not going to work mm -hmm. because there just isn't enough to play with to, to, to give the book any vision to give the book a dimensional interest. And one of the things I like about this format, again, it's called a pop-up, but there's only two to be pedantic. There's only two pops in the mm -hmm. book. The pop is when you, turn the page and something is activated and it rises from the page. Mm -hmm. But what the book has in every, in every opening is depth. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the only thing I enjoyed about the, I only saw the first Avatar um, movie. The one thing I appreciated about that movie and also uh, in, in 3D movies, what I find most interesting, and this also happens in uh, 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 Vim, uh, Lars von Trier's The Cave of Forgotten Dreams, Mm -hmm. is when you get depth in 3D movies. That's mm -hmm. what I find really interesting, not the the gimmicks of things coming at you. Yeah. Uh, in Cave of Forgotten Dreams, there were times where I started to try to see if I could look around the corners of some of the stalactites. That's, that's when I feel like I'm really immersed in something. And that's what I'm trying to do in, in these books, is show you that with just a few lines... Schultz is really creating this world space mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because again, he's, he's working with, with small, with, with small area and only a few lines, but he's able to do a lot with those few lines. And that's what I hope this book helps people. What these books help people to see is just that even with these few lines, Schultz is really doing a lot. And that's how, all I'm hoping to do without creating anything new, just adding some color to it and but and adding depth. All I'm doing is just re-emphasizing things that are already there. Yeah. Yeah. Well and I love that idea of celebration and using something that exists but kind of bringing a new view to it in a way, I guess you could say. Yeah, that's 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 basically it. Bring a new view to it. Uh, I think I say in the essay, I hope you enjoyed this new look at an old friend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not, it's not a new thing. It's just a new look at it. Yeah. Um, so if I'm a listener out there and I want to purchase a copy, I imagine, of course, Abrams would be a good place to go to check out at the publisher site. Any other spaces where people yeah. can check it out or um, follow what you're doing? Uh if you go to comicsmachine.com slash peanuts, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, what I'm doing there is I'm collecting uh, all the information about the book. So if you go to comicsmachine.com slash peanuts, uh, you'll be able to see uh, the cover of the book. You can download the catalog page that has more information about it. It'll take you right to the Abrams page that has links to all your major retailers and things like that. Uh, it's got a video of the original Peanuts uh, artist book that I did, mm -hmm. and it also is collecting uh, links to like my appearances, my interviews, 
this this interview will get listed there. Oh, great, great. Uh, and uh, any other uh, reviews or interviews that I've done, that it's, it'll be your one-stop shopping place for more than you ever wanted to know about this book and hopefully the uh, books to follow in the series. Sounds wonderful. Wonderful. Well, uh, I always appreciate hearing about your views on comics and culture and always appreciate your work. Anything that we've missed in this trifecta talk before we close out? No, you've been very generous with your time and I appreciate your interest. Absolutely. Absolutely. Glad to have you back anytime. And um, we will find other some other corner of comics to explore at some point soon, I'm sure. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you so much, Gene.